Cool. Well, welcome everyone to the last session of Chow. Thanks for hanging out, hanging in there with us for those of you on the East Coast. Now it's late in the afternoon. Um, well, hopefully with all the sessions that you've joined so far, you're feeling excited, hopeful, optimistic, or all of the above about the future of our oceans, coasts, and great lakes. Um, first, some logistics, like all Zoom events, please mute yourself unless you are chatting. Um, this session is also being recorded. And throughout the entire time, if anything comes up, you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll try to address them in the last 10 minutes. Um, but we have 45 minutes here together. We'll try to run through some intros um, and then we'll jump right into discussion. So welcome everyone. Let me introduce myself. I'm Nina Lodpakin. I'm a program officer at Oceankind. Um, we're a foundation based in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm usually based in San Jose, California on unceded Ohlone land. Um, I'm joined here today by my two wonderful panelists, Mary Turnipseed, who's at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, and Melvin Alvarez, who's at the 11th hour. Um, today, we're going to jump into a pretty free-flowing, candid, informal conversation, as this is the last session for Chow. We're keeping it pretty casual. Um, and in general, the topic of this conversation is how we as marine funders of conservation work are advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion and justice. Um, take a step back really quickly. We are represent representative of private foundations or private funders as opposed to sources of public funding, um, but all three of our foundations look to aim to direct resources to people and projects looking to improve the health of our oceans. Um, taking another step, step back into the field of philanthropy in general, I think we want to recognize that the business of philanthropy has its problems. There are inherent power imbalances with our relationships between grantees versus funders, um, folks asking for resources and money versus those gatekeepers to the resources and the funds. Um, because of this inherent power imbalance, you know, philanthropy can perpetuate inequity and injustice um, in both how we distribute those funds and who ultimately receives those resources and funding. Um, I also want to recognize that private foundations can often be a black box into how we operate and how we work and how we make decisions. Um, we're not a field of known for being very transparent. So hopefully today uh, we want to share some insights with you um, to increase that level of transparency about how philanthropy works and how private um, funding works. Um, by really sharing how our respective foundations and um, how we as you know, staffers at these foundations are integrating DEI principles in our work in marine conservation. Um, so without further ado, I wanna hand it over to my fellow panelists to um, introduce themselves further, um, both by just doing a basic introduction, you know, name, um, where you're calling from, pronouns, organization you represent, title, um, but also want to ask you this question of, you know, give us a general overview of your DEIJ learning journey, both, both personally and with the foundation that you're with. Um, give us a sense of how that journey has evolved and maybe how your personal learning journey has evolved. So I'll start with, with Melvin. Uh, thank you, Nina. Um, and hello, everyone. My name is Melvin Alvarez. I'm a grant program associate with 11th Hour Racing, uh, a program of the broader philanthropic network of Eric and Wendy Schmidt. I am, I use he and him pronouns, and I am zooming in from Rhode Island, the ancestral lands of Narragansett and the Wampanoag people. Um, to start, I think I 
just want to start by saying that, you know, most people in this room have likely experienced being in a marine classroom or in an office where there are only a handful or no people of color in the room. We are all aware of the problem. Our field has historically lacked diverse representation uh, in general. So, you know, I was often one of the only uh, students of color at many of the colleges uh, classes that I was taking. Uh, so I can tell you from my lived experience navigating the field that marine conservation, we have a lot of work to do to increase diverse representation in ocean conservation. In, you know, everyone here has a role to play to change the future of that of our field. Um, so I'm grateful and I'm excited to be part of this panel to be talking about issues that, I'm very, that are very personal to me and my intersectional identity. As an immigrant from Honduras, a first-generation college student, a brown ocean nerd, and now a funder in marine conservation. As a funder, I can share insight about, about the ongoing learning and action taking place at the Schmidt Ocean Coalition to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, or DEIJ. What we are, are informally calling the Schmidt Ocean Coalition is a group of four ocean-related entities. My office, 11th Hour Racing, um, Schmidt Ocean Institute, Schmidt Marine Technology Partners, and the Schmidt Family Foundation. While each entity has been on its own journey, 2015 was a pivotal year for our work on DEIJ. That year, an internal DEI matching fund was established to incentivize programs across our entities to direct more funding into organizations led by people of color. In addition to DEI learning seminars, this DEI matching fund was an incentive to diversify our portfolios and to better incorporate DEIJ into our practices. But things really ch uh, changed and picked up in urgency since 2020 due to the pandemic in the Black Lives Matter movement that really made our society talk more openly about injustices. I, I'm sure this resonates with some of you. And so the Schmidt Ocean Coalition was created that year and our four ocean focused entities came together despite our different strategic missions to provide joint support to organizations that work to improve inclusion in marine fields through education and early career opportunities. And we have invested significant time and effort to understand the systematic barriers for entry and retention of the next generation of diverse scientists, marine professionals, educators, and ocean advocates. During our discovery process, we came across three facts that are hard to ignore. So first, uh, is the fact that out of all PhDs awarded in ocean, atmospheric, and earth sciences between 2017 and 20, I'm sorry, 1973 and 2017, less than 2% of those went, uh, went to call women of color. So think about that. That's less, that's less than 2% out of all the PhDs over 20 year period. The second shocking fact is that according to Green 2.0, in uh, the 2014 report, less than when it comes to diversity among environmental organizations, less than 16% of staff at these organizations identify as people of color. And that includes governmental agencies and foundations. And the third fact is related to funding. Between 2014 and 2018, there was a 2.7 billion funding gap between white-led organizations and those led by people of color working in the environmental field. And that's 2.7 billion with the B. So these three simple facts about our field always shock me, but at the same time motivate me because having this knowledge really, it's having this knowledge at hand really, you know, gives me the uh, ability to take action. And so I think that together, little by little, 
we can start to advance through diversity and justice in maritime conservation. And this is how my team and I are approaching this work via incremental changes. And so part of our commitment, the Schmidt Ocean Coalition has pulled an additional annual funding of about $1 million to support diverse leaders and organizations. But we need everyone in this virtual room, from students to leaders, to talk about these issues and to take small steps to make sure that the future marine classrooms or offices have more than one person of color in the room. Um, so I'll stop there and hand it over to Mary. Thanks, Melvin, and thanks, Nina. It's great to be here with y'all today. I'm Mary Turnipseed. I'm a program officer at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. My pronouns are she and her, and I live and work on the unceded lands of the Ramatu Shaloni people, uh, what is also known as San Francisco. The Marine Conservation Initiative that I sit within at the Moore Foundation uh, focuses our grant making on conserving large, intact ocean ecosystems of North America. And in particular, I've got the extreme privilege of focusing my thoughts and concerns and days and hours on grant making in the US and Canadian Arctic Ocean. And I'm again, I'm really happy to be here today. I think I'll, I'll focus my comments really on my work with indigenous governments and organizations which have been, which has been an important focus of my and the Moore Foundation's learning journey uh, in diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. You know, as as many of you know, the North American Arctic is always has been and always will be stewarded by the Inuit, Aleut, Gwich'in, Athabascan, First Nations, and Métis peoples. And coming into the foundation, though, as a marine ecologist 10 years ago, basically all I knew was that the ocean ecosystem couldn't be protected separate from consideration of the well-being of the communities that the human communities that are a part of it. And I, and I had a deep respect for people who really know the ocean and know how to harvest food from it. But that was it. Over time, I've been able to develop a portfolio of partnerships with Inuit, Aleut, and Cree governments and organizations in particular, as well as with non-government, with non-Indigenous non-governmental organizations that partner well with them. And to do so has required a ton of listening to people who know the most about the Arctic, the people who live there and gaining a really strong understanding of their rights and deep cultural ties to the ocean. So my journey really as a grant maker started with a clear sense of how little I knew about how best to safeguard Arctic ecosystems and their biodiversity and their social ecological vibrance. And initially I asked for advice from other funders with experience in the Arctic. And I listened hard to the remarkable people that I got to develop grants with. And I read and I learned about the devastating, devastating history of what the indigenous peoples of the US and Canadian Arctic have experienced. And this learning and humility with which I've tried to approach my work continues to this day. So, Thinking about more foundation more broadly and its diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice journey, you know, we are more realizing more and more each year how integral partnering with indigenous communities, governments, and organizations will be to conserving the large intact ecosystems that are a real central focus of our environment program in particular. And every year. Personally, I seek to make more grants to indigenous governments and organizations and ensure that support within my organization stays strong so that we can continue pursuing our Arctic conservation goals with our indigenous partnerships and true partnership. Nina, over to you. Yeah, I did my brief intro, but let me give you some insight into where I came from. Um, like Melvin, I often found myself to be the only person of color in the room working in the environmental conservation space. I think it started in high school, growing up in a 
really white neighborhood, affluent neighborhood where I was literally one of two Filipinos in my high school and we had lockers next to each other, which is really <laughs> random. <laughs> but um, really until, it wasn't until when I went to undergrad that I found my Filipino community. Um, folks there were really uh, focused on increasing our own representation, getting more people who look like us into the University of California system, you know, as a public institution. Um, and from there, I feel like every institution, every organization, grad school, you know, small nonprofits, NGOs that I went to, I was always the one fighting for, you know, why don't we talk about increasing diversity, increasing representation, um, how do we make these spaces more inviting and inclusive for people of color? Because I feel uncomfortable in the space, but I don't know how to articulate that. Um, and so it really, I always felt like there was a lot of pushback when I was bringing these ideas and issues up. It always felt like a fight, like something that I had to uh, justify and provide a lot of evidence for. Um, and it really wasn't until the events of 2020, you know, we went through pandemic, horrible tragic events, murder around George Floyd, and, you know, really the Black Lives Matter movement um, coming to the forefront, even though it had been happening for a long time. But that was like a window of opportunity um, to really start to lead efforts uh, around the EIJ in my work at Ocean Kind, something that you know, I didn't think was going to be possible. Um, and 2020 happened. So uh, in general, Ocean Kind is a relatively new funder. Um, and like many organizations, 2020 was an eye opening year for us. But as a new funder, we it's kind of an advantage. Um, we're able to integrate from the very beginning, what it looks like to operationalize some of the things that we can do as a grant maker um, to promote DEIJ, both in how we make grants and who we fund. Um, we're a very nimble foundation. We're only a staff of six people. We make decisions quickly. We have a learn by doing attitude. Um, and I think that is a really big advantage um, to our organization compared to maybe some other older, bigger foundations who are more set in their processes and practices. So with that, we've been able to get funding out the door relatively quickly. Um, we're able to provide a lot of flexibility and I think our grantees really appreciate that. Awesome. Melvin, how do you or your foundation integrate diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice into your grant making and grant making operations. And you, can you share any examples that you're really proud of? Um, sure. So, I mean, that's a big question. So I'll try to keep it short, <laughs> uh, which is not a strong suit of mine, just so you all warned. Uh, I like to talk. Um, so first, I think, you know, we generated a landscape assessment to figure out what our baseline is when it comes to directing funds to BIPOC-led organizations across our entities. This showed that different teams have made successful gains um, in terms of diversifying our grantee portfolios in that we needed to do a little bit more to be better allies. Um, and yet, folks, I realized that I often use the term BIPOC, and by that I'm referring to Black, Indigenous, and people of color. I apologize in advance. It's sort of a habit, and I'm trying to shake it off. Um, you know, once we had this assess initial assessment, we committed to do more funding to more BIPOC-led organizations, and not just to BIPOC-servant NGOs. So each entity started to figure out how to do more to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice within their portfolios. Um, but in principle, we aim to follow trust-based philanthropic model. Um, for my office at 11th Hour Racing, we saw that while we are investing about a third of our grant funding in diverse communities, we are not doing enough to support organizations led by people of color. And so, 
our first action was to pledge a 10% increase of our annual budget to specifically invest in new BIPOC leaders. We recognize that this 10% increase was just a target to start with and hopefully grow over time. You know, we also uh, were able to examine funding gaps across our strategies and to pledge in, and to pledge ways to address them. For example, in efforts to advance diverse representation in ocean fields, we recognize that we need to do more funding uh, for opportunities and pathways with students of colors to have access to career growth in their field. Um, and Elementary Hour Racing is providing K through 12 experiential education uh, in STEM funding. Our sibling entity, Schmidt Ocean Institute, works to um, work with researchers at universities and the Schmidt, uh, the Schmidt Technology Partners, our other sibling entity, works with startups in ocean conservation. And so we realized that a big funding gap across our entities was to support the early career professional path into uh, ocean fields, including more paid internships and fellowships. And this is where we're guiding the $1 million Ocean Coalition funding. Another example that I think is really cool is from the Schmidt um, Family Foundation, where they pledged the Donors of Colors Network to direct at least 30% of climate funding to BIPOC groups and to increase transparency. The Schmidt Family Foundation also joined the Democracy Frontlines, Frontlines Fund, which pulled 36 million to support 10 Black-led organizations selected by independent, an independent committee of 10 women of color working in racial justice movement. And you know, these are just a few examples that I'm very proud of. Nina, how would you uh, answer that question? Yeah, it's both in who we fund and how we do it. Um, I think Ocean Kind from the very beginning has embraced this framework called trust-based philanthropy, even before we knew what trust-based philanthropy really was. And we're like, oh, there's actually this framework and principles around what we're doing and how we do it. Um, one of the principles is provide general operating support, multi-year support. I think there's nothing that says more as a funder that I trust you grantee to do the best work that you think um, is best for you and where you would like to see this field go um, by just providing unrestricted funding. Um, another principle is putting, taking the burden off of grantees, both in paperwork, and administrative things that we just really don't need. Like we don't ask for narrative reports. Maybe a lot of those of you who um, are on the grant seeking side, you'll really appreciate that. We just do verbal check-ins, which has been working great. Um, we do a lot of the homework, uh, especially for new relationships to learn about you and your organization based on existing materials, um, other proposals that you've submitted to funders, we'll, we'll accept that. <laughs> Um, and then I think uh, something that other folks really appreciate in addition to the general operating support is when we do have project support grants, um, we are open to conversations about how can I support you as an organization um, in your capacity building? What kind of staff do you need? Do you need communication support? Do you need development support? All those things that really aren't covered by you know, indirect costs or things that are covered by a project specific grant. Um, and then in terms of where we direct funds, we have carved out a, a slice of funding specifically for DEI. Um, this is mostly field building efforts, but in addition to that, in our existing program work, we do try to find areas where it intersects with environmental justice um, issues. So for example, um, Mary, you've been working with my colleague, Mariko, on developing some indigenous-led conservation efforts in Canada to support Arctic um, conservation, you know, elevating diverse perspectives um, and voices in the oceans and climate conversation. Um, but in general, I'm most excited about how we got funding out the door relatively quickly for a pretty new funder, both in 2020 and 2021. 
uh, that DEI specific support really went to um, efforts to increase diversity. So like what Melvin was saying, um, reducing those barriers for BIPOC, emerging BIPOC leaders in this space, um, find new mentorship opportunities, fellowship opportunities, paid fellowship opportunities. Um, the second bucket I would call broader field support, recognizing we're a marine conservation funder, but the environmental movement in general, um, you know, needs some bolstering and tools um, to really move this work forward. So we've supported, for example, Green 2.0, you know, they're um, a report that's put out to increase transparency about the state of diversity in environmental conservation. Um, and then third bucket I'm super excited about is direct support to environmental justice led efforts to BIPOC led efforts, BIPOC serving organizations, um, grassroots efforts, um, you know, those maybe who have been ignored by funders for the past 10, 20 years, but who now want to, I want to bring to the table um, and, and increase their support. You know, that sounds amazing. Um, thanks for sharing. Um, I have a question for all of us here. Uh, and maybe I'll start with you, Mary. Um, as you and the foundation embark on your DEI journey, um, how are your grantees responding? How has your relationship with grantees changed or evolved since your foundation started to integrate DEIJ into your grant making? Yeah, thanks, Melvin. I, I'm going to go quickly through this because I'm really interested in what y'all have to say <laughs> more than me. I mean, at more, the diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice lens has enabled us to ask ourselves, who have we overlooked because of our biases and our bias networks? And who uh, that we have overlooked could be really integral to achieving the conservation goals that we share? You know, uh, uh, conservation outcomes remain our North Star. That's a big part of why this foundation that I get to work for was established. But to this end, we've always been committed to bringing the strongest, most effective portfolio of partners to achieve the outcomes that our board approves and to make those outcomes durable. And today, and for a while now, we've known that those the strongest, most effective portfolio of partners is not just the tra traditional environmental NGOs that we've all heard of. In fact, it goes well, well beyond that in the places we work, like the Arctic. So for example, in the US Arctic, one of the strongest voices and uh, with a lot of power can come from tribal governments like the Aleut community of St. Paul Island, which was featured earlier today at Chow, uh, and which is striving for co-management and stewardship of the Pribilof Islands ecosystem and recovery of that ecosystem in the Bering. You know, I mean, it, it, just in sum, I think that a diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice lens enables program staff like me to take a hard look, forces us to take a hard look at our assumptions, and our blind spots about who can bring the most power and expertise to bear to achieve our, our goals to protect and manage the ocean better and to do so fast. Um, I, I, I don't know how much our grantees know about the work we finally started to do as an organization at the foundation, but I hope that our relationships, our grant portfolios, and our impact are starting to show the benefits of that. Mm. Melvin, what about you? Um, well, I mean, I love to hear more about your work on with indigenous communities. And you already got me, Mary. Um, <laughs> you know, when it comes to our grantee relationship and evolution, uh, I will say that there is much more trust with our grantees now, um, expressing our commitment to integrate, intentionally focus our, our direct grant funding uh, to programs addressing, addressing DEIJ really reaffirms our commitment to communities most disproportionately affected by climate change, often black and brown communities. So as a result, 
I think, you know, both white led organizations and in particularly those led by people of color are being more trusting of our commitments and our partnership. Um, you know, as funders, we have encouraged our grantees to hire diverse staff and to re in, that reflects the communities that they serve. Uh, in providing the extra funding to hire this diverse staff is easy, really. That's what we do for a living. Um, but having that initial conversation with these grantees can be challenging. But, you know, we can have those tough conversations with grantees because we have been able to build trust over time and our explicit commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice has helped us set the stage to start having these difficult conversations with grantees. Um, and these conversations really are based on trust, as you can imagine. Um, you know, I, I also see that increase in trust when grantees now of, you know, feel more comfortable coming to us when they're having specific struggles. For example, one of our grantees working at Dominican Republic came to us uh, and asked for a large unrestricted grant fund because the, of the reduce of tourism travel and revenue due to uh, loss due to, due to the pandemic has severely affected their ability to remain operational. And this grantee trusted us to be able to support them during this challenging time. And we were the first funder they approached uh, for such help, giving our commitments and our increase in trust. Um, Nina, what about you guys at Ocean Kind, if you have some uh, thoughts? Yeah, so new funder, not too much data to look back on, but we do ask our grantees every year to fill out a quick annual survey. Um, and I just wanted to share some of the feedback that we've received in general, so far very positive. Um, I think I've already said this, a lot of appreciation for general operating support and general flexibility. Um, appreciate that we're focused on the work rather than the paperwork. Uh, and again, Melvin, like what you were saying, really trust, trusted and genuine relationships rather than transactional relationships is what we've been seeing. Uh, and I think that creates more opportunities to truly co-create outcomes and projects and collaborate with each other. It's more like a partnership instead of like a grantee funder relationship. I want to notice, yeah, we're watching the time and we have <laughs> two good questions in here. <laughs> um, do we want to start with questions or do we want to, I mean, I feel like we should share our challenges too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Melba, do you quickly want to share some of the challenges in doing this work before we uh, move to questions? Sure. Um, you know, I'll say that our biggest challenge has been systematic. Um, it is challenging to change the way systems work. So while we have this new funding and investing investment focus on um, BIPOC-led organization, it has been a challenge for us to reach those uh, leaders of colors. Uh, and find ways to support them under our current strategic focus. Uh, for example, in an area in the area of marine tech, the reality is that there's not a lot of BIPOC-led ocean tech startups out there, and it's unlikely it will take a while for marine tech to have more diverse leaders in the just in general. Um, so when, so given this systematic issue, uh, we are struggling to fund more BIPOC tech leaders in understanding this challenge. We are hope, hope, hopeful that time and investment in more early career opportunities will help us get there, but it's really a, a big issue across our field. Um, I think I, Becky, you want to, we can chat offline too, because your question 
hit right on the mark of one of the things that we missed in this conversation, um, which we recognized as we were preparing for this, is a lot of this conversation has been focused on advancing DEI in a U.S. context. It is something that Ocean Kind is currently struggling, challenging, grappling with, whatever the word you want to use. Um, and I'll quickly share, maybe I'm thinking about maybe one way to promote DEIJ in an international context is, you know, there's a lot of environmental advocates, environmental lawyers who are going up against scary projects like offshore oil and gas and big corporations with lots of money. And oftentimes in the global South, usually um, these folks are in harm's way literally their lives are in danger or they're risking imprisonment. And are there, is, is there a funding opportunity there? Um, can we provide rapid response to, to, to when really bad things happen on the ground? Um, are there ways to mitigate that risk? Is there, um, can we partner with some other legal actions to, to put in place um, some, procedures, SOPs before before things go south. So that's what I'm thinking about. And it is challenging in my, yeah, my challenge for the year. <laughs> uh, Melvin, you had a question specific yeah. about um, the 10% target increase in funding. Um. First, I think Nina, you're you're just hitting a big question that we at the Schmidt entities have been struggling uh, to figure out how to do best. With, you know, the question of you know U.S. focus or North American focus versus international funding when it comes to DEI, and there's just so many factors that you need to bring into account when you move from you know outside of the U.S. like religion, different. Uh, ethnic backgrounds, historical context. Um, so a lot of that backdrop in, from, in, in gender, I think gender and LGBTQ identities, a lot of these additional layers make it so much difficult to make, make it easy to say, all right, we'll do a DIJ work globally. Um, we still aim to you know, have a geographic focus um, and in part of it, that's why a lot of the times the international DEIJ commitments are just harder to achieve. Uh, but it doesn't mean that, you know, we are going to pass an amazing program just because it's not based in the U.S. And I think that's sort of what Nina was saying early when you were talking about flexibility. Um, we are on the same boat. Um, Real quick, there was a question on the chat, I think, about outreach and how to get in touch with us in terms of BIPOC-led organizations um, by Susan. Um, uh, the easiest way, you know, is going to Lamethar Racing's website. We have, taken, we, are, we have an open call for proposals and we review um, easy, you know, one-page proposal where you just tell us about your pro project, you put a dollar amount that it costs or that you're asking for, um, and we review them twice a year, once in, early in the year, and the upcoming second deadline is, I think, June 15th. Um, and, you know, that's literally the easiest way to, for folks to uh, come to us with ideas um, that fit our strategy. Um, you know, definitely LinkedIn is another easy way to contact me. Um, yeah. And then the other specific question, what was it, Nina? 10% target to increase funding. Um, so yes, the, the, this is like the perpetual question of, of right, like what is a BIPOC-led organization? Um, you know, based on our commitment to, in uh, our, with Green 2.0, um, we tend to follow those guidelines where uh, we ideally want to fund organizations that where the board and the staff are um, primarily uh, people of color. So with 51% more, more or more, uh, or at least 51% of the board um, and the staff uh, are people of color. 
but you know, we really understand that a lot of the times that's not feasible. Um, and sometimes we make judgment calls. Um, you know, the, I intentionally said that the 10% target to invest in leaders of color, and that is very much with trying to build that um, flexibility. And sometimes we fund an organization where whose board is not as diverse, but their staff is and their executive director is. Um, an 11th hour raising model is a bit different from the other organizations and established philanthropic groups, I will say. So a lot of the times we invest in early organizations and help them you know, get set up. We Sometimes we just fund an individual to get them because they have a great idea. They want to connect kids to natures in under-resourced communities and they don't have an NGO yet set up. So sometimes we just pay for staff. We pay for them to get uh, Fly 1C3 status certified. Um, and we really help them get started from the get-go um, with at a time where a lot of funders are not willing to invest in you know, just an individual at that point. Um, so yeah, we get creative. I'm now realizing we have two minutes left. So maybe we just do a quick round of last thoughts, closing thoughts. Um, Mary, do you wanna start? I cede my time to Melvin, are you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Melvin, do you want to, <laughs> you want to have the last word? Um, I'm happy to. I mean, mine's quick. I'm just going to say, you know, I think as funders, the biggest way we can have impact is by getting the money out the door. Um, and I think slowly but surely philanthropy in general is trying to shift more funding to BIPOC led initiatives, BIPOC serving organizations. So, um, if you're out there, if you're on this call, Hopefully I'm a friendly, happy, approachable face. <laughs> Feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn or um, email me directly. That was beautiful. Thank you, Nina. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're very much approaching the top of the hour. So um, I guess there's not much to say other than it's been a pleasure to be part of this panel and thank you all for um, the engaging conversation. Thank you. Thank you all. I don't know how to close this. <laughs> Kevin, um, wait until people leave the room for a bit. Um, yeah. Cool. We needed some outro music. I know, we didn't have intro <laughs> music. Jeopardy. Jeopardy. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Oh, thank you all so thank much. You. And so for your great questions and inspired. No. being engaged at this late hour. I'm tired. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you are. Oh man. And you had a recharge for uh for Azul tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when this link's available, y'all, I'll try and pay attention. I'll send it. You know, I mean, we can maybe share it with folks that we think could enjoy, well, listening to it or something. No. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Who it's a, um, I'm assuming the foundation would basically just share that, right? Yeah. Oh, like Chow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I would think so. I don't know if you have to be registered to get to the recordings or not, but yeah, well, let's check that out. I can chime in here now. I'm guessing you were kind of asking oh. for me. I, I had another yeah. uh, show in my ear, so I couldn't quite hear, but um, so they, they, I believe they will get edited. Um, I'm not sure exactly when they'll be done, um, but yes, I believe Chow will be in charge of them. I would just reach out to whoever um, got you into, into this part, and then they should be able to at least point in the right direction, so. Cool. Um, Oh, um, thanks, much Kevin. But yeah, absolutely. no, that's good to know. Yeah, thank y'all. All right. Oh my God, we ran we over did time. It. We, we did, did it. No. Good. Yeah. Did good. yeah. Thank you, Nina, oh, for pulling yeah, it together. You. Thank you, Kevin, for helping. No, thank you for absolutely. participating and prepping and agreeing to join me on this crazy <laughs> idea. <laughs>
Thanks for doing this. Matt. Oh, yeah. Are people yeah. interested yeah. in this topic? <laughs> I know there was a lot more people. Yeah. And then I was like, what are in the room? You know, I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. Congratulations, y'all. We done. We did it. We Have did a great it. Great evening. Yes. Bye, y'all. Melvin, I look forward Thank to meeting you in person. Yeah. Likewise. Bye. Santa Barbara. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Bye. Adios. Bye.